there, Dread Mark right here, and I got yet another Legends of Fraternio for you guys today. Yesterday I uploaded a Leona Daybreak deck, and today we get a pretty much a rework for Day Daybreak in many ways. So yeah, that's actually <laughs> I in case you're wondering, like I did I did see like the uh they did announce a patch preview, right? Which was this right here. But the thing is I bulk recorded those videos up until yesterday. So as soon as I was done with Leona, I went onto Twitter and I saw that they were gonna buffer. I'm like, well, you're gonna get a lot of Leona lately. And I mean I guess that's fine. I haven't really showcased Daybreak too often on the channel, so I'm actually really excited for that. So here we are, ladies and gentlemen. In case you're wondering, because I haven't really actually explained, we're gonna be reviewing the balance changes i just went over them uh and i'm gonna be talking about them now really really excited about the vast majority of them i think this is a brilliant patch and i am super eager to try out many of the buffed cards and i'm so happy to see the nerfs that have been listed even though nami and ionia based uh, combo decks are going to be very much around everything else that was a little bit annoying in the meta has pretty much been halted and i think it's just a wonderful thing so without further ado even i'm even wearing my Nilfgaard shirt here you know because it has a sun on it and i felt the uh, I thought it would be fitting in some way. We are recording, right? Okay, correct. Let's do this. So, here we go. Here's a look at each of the card updates coming in this patch. They, they did this, and then they said a small peek behind the curtains. Uh, basically, what they say here is that there were uh, a couple of extra uh, balance changes that did not make it on, on this graphic, but ended up happening anyways. And uh, I think it's, it's really good that they don't restrain themselves, uh, you know, and if there is a change that they they think that needs to happen, they do it anyways, even if it makes the, their presentation suffer a little bit. I'm all for that. So let's just hop onto the changes and talk about them because there's quite a bit to talk about and it's really exciting. First of all, champions and related cards buffs. First of all, Leona complete rework. I mean, not complete, but pretty much close to that because when I was expecting a Leona buff, this is not what I had in mind. She goes from a four drop to a five mana unit and still has a daybreak effect of stunning the strongest enemy, but now has challenger with a three, five stat line. And when leveling up, when you daybreak, you stun the strongest enemy and you give me barrier this round. Barrier combined with Challenger, Lee Sin style will allow you to start picking off the board and will give Daybreak much needed interaction. The only thing that I don't like about this is that they make Leona a five drop and making Leona a five drop is a bit of an issue because you do want to play Raven, I think, in Daybreak decks, unless maybe now you don't, but I, I have a hard time believing you wouldn't, as Raven allows you to play multiple Daybreak cards per turn. But uh, Raven is also, I was expecting Raven to have been changed to like a four drop or something, but no, he is actually still a five drop. So now you, you have the champion and the prime follower kind of like butting heads, wanting to be played on curve. And uh, I do feel like that's a little bit of an issue, but not nearly enough to uh, go against something like this you know leona paying one more mana is a significant nerf to a card right but gaining challenger like that is a price you pay for a keyword like challenger especially if you get to combine it with barrier as well really really uh cool we lost the overwhelm though important to note there's no challenger overwhelm combination uh as she's going to be there to just control the board more than anything i think it's more fitting for leona honestly i like it uh, it makes her more similar to Diana as uh, you're kind of, uh, the design is similar because Diana combines quick attack with challenger, right? To essentially challenge stuff and not die. And Leona is technically doing the same, but with barrier instead. So uh, it kind of unites the two. And I guess lore wise, maybe that, that makes sense. Or maybe it doesn't. I don't fucking know. Like they believe in the sun and the moon. And you know, that's just ridiculous to me. So yeah. Well, they believe in them being gods. Like I do believe the sun and the moon exist. You know, just just clarifying that for 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 context, because otherwise, I can get trashed. All right, let's talk about the sun guardian. One of the coolest changes this patch. He used to be a six mana five, uh, a six five actually, a six five, a six mana six five. Well, was it that big? I don't think it was that big actually. Maybe it was. I don't know. Uh, but it got changed. This is actually a rework. Three mana, two, three with Daybreak. Or when you activate another Daybreak, grant. Important uh, emphasis on that. Grant me plus one, plus one. So 
coming in, it's a three mana, three, four. And every time you tr trigger Drake Rick, you are going to be beefing it up. And I think it's really neat that they did this with this card because the three mana slot is actually one that I, I wanted Daybreak to uh, enhance on because right now we have Solari Priestess and you don't always want to go for the low tempo, high value play. Sometimes you want to be fighting for the board, you're getting pressured and having a three drop that can do just that and keep on growing is fantastic and I absolutely just adore this design and this rework for the Sun Guardian, which was otherwise a pretty eh, sort of like late game overwhelm bomb. And now it's significantly more interesting in my opinion. I just, I really, one of my favorite changes easily. As then Morning Light, which is Leona's signature spell, in case you don't know, went from five mana to three mana, but now it gives plus one, plus one this round and activates all Daybreak Allies effects. Uh, insane buff, right? Like, yeah, you're getting uh, less of a buff on your board overall, but paying three mana to trigger all of your daybreak effects on board is insane and definitely worth it with uh you know the two like going from five to three like just two mana cost reduction is one of the craziest buffs ever and the price that you're paying for it is just nowhere near the benefits so i really really like these changes solari stericon another change that i absolutely adore uh, it, it, before this it was a five mana five six i believe or maybe four six actually i think it's a four six yeah it was a five mana four six that was another unit that came in and just healed everything, right? But this is not a Soraka deck, and we don't really benefit too much from that. Now we're actually getting that health boost, but we're adding on to it, which is what it should have been from the beginning, in my opinion. Now this card is way more interesting and actually adds a lot to Daybreak. And because Leona is leaving the four mana slot, Solari Stericorn makes even more sense. And we have a strategy that can go wide and really outmuscle the opponent with just pure stats. This is a big stat drop by turn four and can be even very relevant later than the line as well. And with morning light, you're getting stats, you're stunning shit, like it is amazing. Like Daybreak is really taking form now and I think it's going to be so much better than it was before, which is really cool because even though it wasn't one of the uh, archetypes that I was the most excited about with its inception because it essentially played the first, first card every turn, right? It's not the most, um, you know, from a gameplay mechanic, it's not the more intriguing one of the two. Uh, I really do feel like it's been overshadowed for far too long, pun intended. And uh, we're going to be getting, you know, some some good muscle onto it. So really, really love these changes. And Sunburst at five. This goes beyond Daybreak, ladies and gentlemen. This is crazy. <laughs> this is insane. This is like the Vengeance buff. This is like actually perhaps one of the craziest buffs in the entire patch. Like this is nuts for five mana. Being able to kill a unit, silencing it, so no matter how big it is, it will die unless it naturally has more than six health, is um, just crazy, absolutely crazy. And it's gonna not be a not only is it gonna be a thing in daybreak decks, but it's also gonna be very relevant in any sort of target based uh, control deck. I think uh, people were already main decking sunburst uh, a lot of times as a meta tech option, and now it uh, looks more like an auto include. It really does feel like it's reached that vengeance tier, and this is gonna be one of the most uh, meta, meta defining changes in the patch, in my opinion. And uh, oh, let, let's move on from from day to night as Nocturne is finally being more flexible for deck building. Nocturne has been one of the most rigid uh, champions in the game. Uh, it, it, he basically has one deck. Unlike Diana, who is also a Nightfall champion, she's not at nearly as restricted as Nocturne. She has been the face of many mono target invoke decks, invoke decks with a little bit of a Shadow Owl Splash, amongst many other things. I even featured a deck recently with her with Ionia and Soul Sword. She can definitely go beyond pure Nightfall list, but you cannot say the same for Nocturne. And now that changes because you can level up Nocturne by attacking with five or more Nightfall or Fearsome allies. So now there is Fearsome synergy and they're going beyond that by including Vile Maw, giving Fearsome allies plus one power and having the Twisted Tree line trigger with Nightfall allies as well. So all these, these specifically like these two cards are kind of like uniting these two archetypes that used to be technically separate even though cards like Stitch and Onlooker are pretty much auto-included in Fearsome decks, now they're going together, and now Nocturne is open up to so many more possibilities. There's like multiple like Nocturne skills, uh, skills, not skins, 
English as well. So I, I really wanted to build more Nocturne decks, but every time I look at the champion, it's just like, yeah, just another, <laughs> I have to make another Nightfall deck. And now I have freedom to, because you may think, well, now he, he goes in, in Nightfall decks and pure fearsome decks, but that's not true. Now you can run certain like decks that aren't really super tribalistic, but have just the right amount of fearsomes. So you can easily level up Nocturne and, and the options are way bigger now. And I really, really uh, appreciate this sort of change from a deck builder, uh, from a deck builder's perspective. I'm, my English is terrible today. I really am a big fan of this one right here. And I'm gonna mess around with Valmal as well. Tommy Boy brought back from the bench as now he's he gets the victor treatment essentially, comes in and creates a uh, his, his spell, the... Um, Acquired taste and acquired taste is going to be generated upon entry. This is actually very relevant. I'm playing Tom Catch a lot. One of my personal favorite champions from Bilgewater and one of my personal favorite champions in the entire game. But you know that that kind of like that's the F word, right? I like a lot of champions, <laughs> but I really do like Tom Kench. He, he's uh, a part of one of my favorite decks of all time, which is Cold Food. I like mixing Tom Kench a lot with Frostbite because I do believe the card, the champion, can be played outside of Frostbite. But the thing is. In those decks that play slower, when you do, it wasn't saved right here. Like when you top deck Tom Kench later than line, you have to wait a turn to actually be able to use them. Now Tom Kench is actually a very nice draw in the later portion of the match because you can immediately swallow something. So uh, really, I mean, I, I don't want to repeat the same expression, but absolutely adore this change. You know, I like all these changes. It's that's right. Like I love it, and <laughs> I'm gonna move on. Master Yi. Now the spell reduction cost will present until the turn end. Until Nami and Lee Sin and our thing. You know, I don't know if Master Yi is going to be taking the meta by storm. I mean, it is very relevant that he's he's reducing the cost of your spells permanently because now they're stacking, and this is actually a crazy buff. But Ioni has a lot going on for it, and there's a lot of competition, and I think that's one of the main reasons why Master Yi has been... Well, also because Master Yi has to be on the board, right? Like, the thing about Master Yi is that if you draw him later, um, you don't really... He's very, very weak if he comes later in the game. Like, this is another reason to draw Master Yi early and or to mulligan aggressively for him. Because if you don't get Master Yi played early on, then you're going to be missing out on the spell reductions, which are going to stack throughout the match. So now, you know, it doesn't fix that issue with the champion itself. Um, also, another issue being that uh, it has an attack effect and that can be difficult to trigger. I mean, with Ionia, it's impossible, right? And you have to mix him with specific regions like Demacia or Noxus that can get free attacks with him in order to benefit from his ability. But ultimately, the big strength in Master Yi now will definitely re re revolve around the, uh, the round start effect and the ability to just make your hand cheaper and cheaper as the turns go by, and thus uh, spell combo decks will be stronger with Yi than they were before. But I believe that Nami, uh, to Fate, Lee Sin will be the face of combo-based Ionia as of now, until that is ultimately handled with, but it's a very nice change to try to make this a uh, bit of an underwhelming champion perhaps shine a little bit better. This expansion had the least performing champions we've had in a while, but honestly, I'd rather have that and you can buff them a little bit than have Gnar happening all over again. You know, just expansions with champions just absolutely dominating the meta and not letting anything else thrive. So yeah, if, if, if I got to pick my poison, I, I'll pick this one and I'm happy that Master G is going to be a little bit rougher this time around. Fiora change is nothing like what I was expecting. Uh, she's actually going to a 4 drop now, and he's a 4-4 four, four challenger. Got that thickness back. Pretty solid stat line in conjunction with the challenger and in conjunction with the win condition. One of the clear things here is, I don't know if clear is the proper word, but one of the key things here is that she can no longer ple be played on curve with Shen. Fiora Shen was essentially the most competitive Fiora deck that dominated the meta in Legend of Runeterra for a very long time. And now with this change, uh, that just doesn't really feel nearly as good because you have two four drops and you can't play them on curve and that kind of makes you want to play stuff like Lauren Prodigy, right? But mono Fiora decks can definitely benefit from the enhanced thickness. And there may be other mid-range decks that can fit her in as well. Uh, a lot of people are scared about Fiora being back in the meta because she is a very polarizing champion and perhaps one of the most disliked champions in the history of the game just because of how binary she 
can be, right? If she runs into the right matchup, then all she has to do is kill four enemies and you win the game. It's an alternate win condition, like Ezreal, which is also a relatively con controversial champion, but this one, um, like that, but on steroids, right? And Ezreal has been, <laughs> Ezreal's perhaps his champion has been nerfed the most times, <laughs> or, or, or like, just redesigned, etc. Like he's been quite problematic, right? And Fiora, ever since that one nerf that just really buried her underground, now she will she'll be back at it. And I'm really eager, intrigued, and a little bit afraid to see what impact she ends up having. And we'll just have to wait for that one right there. Swain just getting a, a very simple buff here. My boy Swain, I miss him. I'm really excited for this change. Wait. I didn't see the overwhelm. Oh, shit. Oh, I didn't see this. Okay, we got to react Andy to this part. I did not see this shit. Oh, <laughs> here I was thinking it was just numerical. No, no, no. Bore stat line and overwhelm. You don't even have to run might for the cheeky Nexus strike anymore. Holy fuck. That is dangerous. Oh, my God. I cannot wait to play some Swain. Oh, he's back with the vengeance. Holy shit. Wow, this is so key. In case you guys are wondering, overwhelm means that if you overwhelm a unit, then you're going to be triggering the Nexus Strike, which allows you to just obliterate their board and Nexus. Wow, holy crap. That's a big deal. That is a crazy buff, actually. Wow, I'm I'm really hyped for that. This is like top three, my favorite champion in the game. So this is in Wow. Wow, okay. Uh, Elawi going back, reverted. You know, that this this nerf was a mistake to begin with. And uh, Orn has a bit of a, an easier level up requirement. Here this says, Orn's level of condition is always on the border of being too late. If you're hitting for 10, your game is generally going fine, even without the lava elementals. By reducing that number a bit, we think Orn can help turn games around more often and maybe hammer out a few more wins. You know, the, the, the dev team with the puns, you know, 10 out of 10. Uh... Uh, hard to agree. This is exactly what it felt like with playing Orn. A lot of times, there's so many games in which I just was barely reaching that level up requirement. And once I did reach the level up requirement, it felt like I didn't need Orn at that point. So I, I feel like this is a very nice change that will hopefully make this champion a little bit more played because he's a really, really cool uh, design and he's got a sick ass animation. I love the art, I love the character. Uh, I love the, the the victory voice lines. They they help contrast me, you know, and kind of like tone me down a little bit. So I appreciate that. And overall, I love your boy, the uh, the godly Smith. I don't really know what the lore behind them is exactly. Is he like a goat or something? I don't even know like if he's supposed to be like an animal or like a, a goat bear. I don't know. But nonetheless, I like him a lot. And I think this is a very, very neat buff for the champion. Now we go on to the nerfs. And this is also extremely important. First of all, the Ego is going to be toned down, uh, going from a 5 cost to a 6 mana champion. I think this is warranted. I think the Ego has been quite dominant for enough, you know. It hasn't been particularly oppressive, but he is actually very oppressive. There's a lot of fun mid-range decks that have no chance against Viego, and having him come one turn later is actually very, very neat, and I think it's warranted at this point. So I'm, I'm happy to see it. Hate Spike and Mark of the Storm are getting reverted. Uh, this was a bit of an experiment uh, by the devs, it seems. I'm going to miss Hate Spike. I think I would personally, I I would like if Hate Spike was one mana, but did not make a husk. Does anybody agree with that? I I, I feel like. I feel like it's making the husk on top of dealing the damage that pushes pushes this card over the edge, but being two mana makes it pretty bad, right? <laughs> like it's just going back to being bad and marker the storm the same. For those of you Kez Kezreal. <laughs> Canon Ezreal. I mean, yeah, that's how you call it. Ke Kezreal, right? Like I, I said it too fast. For those of you Canon Ezreal enthusiasts or haters, probably more more haters than enthusiasts uh, around here. Uh, you're going to be very happy to see this. It's going to be toned back down. And uh, the deck may just go back into obscurity. Which, you know, it's had its time. I personally appreciate it. But perhaps it's been around. And there's a, there's a lot of, already too many like dominant Ionia decks running around. So it's good that that one calms down once more. So yeah, they basically tried this out. They kind of got a little bit toxic. And they decided to revert them back to what they were. And uh, that's, that's one of the things with these like low cost cards, like one drops, two mana cards, or even like zero mana cards, right? 
uh, even though Marcus Storm is tied to a one drop, right? It's very difficult to nerf or buff these sorts of cards without absolutely breaking them or just making them unplayable, right? Because one, you know, one minor tweak, you know, the, the value that they're supposed to, the spectrum of value that you're expecting from a one drop or, or two mana card is limited, right? So if you tweak those numbers, they're going to be more impactful than nerfing something that's a bit higher on the curve. Uh, so it's always very difficult to find the sweet spot for these cards. And sometimes it's just not even possible with its current design. And that's why I was talking about Hate Spike. Like if Hate Spike did not make a husk, then it would be fine in my opinion at one mana. But because it does that and it makes a husk, it's a bit too much. And uh, we all witnessed that playing against all these slay decks. Seinen, uh going from 3-5 to 3-3. I mean, really, really good card that draws you a lot. I think this is a fine uh, nerf that will tone it down a little bit. Still playable, but not the resilient unit that it once it once was. So that's very neat to see. Riptide Sermon took a hit. More than what I was personally asking for, but so be it. It is dealing now three damage and one to the Nexus. People were asking, like, I, I saw people, like, saying, why does Riptide Sermon have to paint the nexus like why the fuck the devs are stupid why are they it's like well maybe you're stupid because it's a bilge water card it's supposed to synergize with plunder effects like it is like taking away the ping effect is is a mistake toning it down and, and having it deal one damage would have been enough in my opinion but now it's dealing three so maybe uh maybe bilge water can tone down and calm down a little bit and i, I think none of us are going to be too upset about that so yeah reptite sermon got a little bit wrecked but, you know, it, it was quite dominant, and I, I think it welcomes change, and that's a good thing. This is like, you know, I've, I, I just, I, words cannot express, words cannot express the happiness that I feel by seeing this. Was it necessary? Can I give you a solid argument for this being a necessity? No, I don't care. I don't fucking care. I will just completely hydrate myself forever with the tears of aggro players as Decimate is down to six mana or up to six mana. And uh, yeah, fuck them. Fuck them all. Fuck all the pirates, all the aggros, all, all the everything, all the English. I am not, <laughs> like, I'm so happy to see this. This is just, Oh, it, it's quite, it's going to be quite controversial, but I don't care. It's just a glorious thing. And it also makes it so that aggro decks can move a little bit outside of Noxus. There's other variants to explore and there's cool aggro concepts like Jinx with Bandle City, for example, and, and such uh, that require more sequencing. And even though they're fast paced decks, they, they there's a lot of decision making behind them, but no more just like mindless play a billion one drops and then play big burn cards and win, you know? That's not gonna be nearly as easy anymore, and just seeing Pirate take this massive hit makes me feel all tingly inside. That's where I'm gonna end that. The Harrowing reverted back to mana. Honestly, this is one of those changes that has been around for a while, but I would argue never should have happened. I think the Harrowing is an extremely powerful card. Uh, one time they decided to revert it down to nine to open it up, but then all sorts of disgusting strategies popped up, like Darius Harrowing was a thing for a while. And the card comes back and forth, not the most relevant in an Ionia meta because there's a lot of deny, but the moment that shifts, this card can be extremely problematic and I think it should just cost 10 mana. For what it does, 10 mana is a proper uh, cost for it. And I'm happy to see it happen, even though not everybody will be, but I think this is a, a warrant of change. Right of Calling going from zero mana to one mana is just nuts. Like they absolutely murdered the card. And um, yeah, I don't I don't know what's gonna be of like slay decks. You know, after the the right of the calling hit and the um, the hate spike hit, it, it's a lot. It's a lot to take in, and uh, not something you can ignore. So we'll see how they they progress. Uh, but I think um, I, let's see the reason. I haven't actually read it. Free calling can be frustrating experience to play against, letting decks access their champions consistently with limited drawbacks. Hopefully this puts some of Shurima's mono champion strategies on hold for a little longer while they wait for an extra mana. No no cheeky puns or anything like here, but yeah, I, I can see it. I can see the reasoning behind it. Um, I wasn't particularly asking for it, but it's not like I'm the biggest fan of these sort of strategies. And uh, you know, even though I do like slay decks, they can survive without this kind of card. And I think it's overall a neat change. 
target is peak. Ecstasia is going to hate this, going from five mana to six mana. You know, I, I absolutely hate this card's existence in the game. I don't think uh, Legend of Terra needs it. But at the same time, it does, uh, you know, open up some fun, you know, big bomb decks. And uh, now just it being six mana is nice. You know, it, it won't be as... I don't know if it'll be playable at a competitive level, to be honest, but I don't think many people are going to be missing something like Target and Speak. Concurrent timelines going from one mana to two. This had to happen. Turn one concurrent timelines and just being able to play two drop, three drop, four drop. Now this card can be nopified. Because before, when you're facing timelines, even if, if you're playing Ionia, like you had to be wary of like, hey, if they have concurrent timelines by turn one, then it doesn't matter if I have the counter. I cannot counter because I don't have the mana to do so, right? So now that play is, is open. Now the curve is a little bit more, uh, it's trickier, right? Because now you can't concurrent timelines into Ionian Hookmaster, for example, right? So setting that back is, is a big deal, actually. And it just messes up their curve and makes it so that they can't just like two drop, three drop, four drop Weapon Master after playing this. And that's a glorious thing. Ultimately, how rough of a hit will it be towards concurrent timelines? Um, I can't really say. Like, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe maybe it's like an, um, an insane nerf, right? Because the, the deck really needs to, this to be one cost. But I don't think that will be the case. It'll definitely be much worse and it'll be more awkward for them to get the full a full value out of their early plays. And it opens up more counterplay, but I don't think it'll ultimately kill the archetype, though I may be wrong, but I, I don't believe it will. And then we got some variety card buffs. We go from the nerfs back to the buffs, but these time, this time these cards are not uh, champions, nor champion spells. We got uh, Eula, who now grants an ally spell shield or overwhelm this round. No, this, this, should, this should not be here. So before it was a, a temporary effect, now it grants, but you have to choose between Spell Shield or Overwhelm. And if you don't, you grant it to me. So she can just grant herself. She can like a three mana, three, three with Overwhelm or a three mana with three, three with Spell Shield. Uh, I love flexible, I, I love cards that op offer multiple options, right? Uh, cards like Twist of Fate. I think they're very good for the game. And I think this is going to all of a sudden be a really strong card for Targon really really strong being able to grant something overwhelm already feels like an auto include for pantheon decks all of a sudden because you can just give one of your big units spell shield if you need to or you can give it overwhelm if you need to having that flexibility is absolutely amazing and you're getting a three mana three three body on top of that so it's, there's like no there's little to no downside to this and uh, this card is going to be from like she, she's gonna go from irrelevant to absolutely a staple at least in faded decks for sure, but she feels really good now, and it's going to make quite the impact in the meta, in my opinion. Paper Tree, don't really care about this card because it's in attachments. The attachments, does that include weapons? It should include weapons, right? Or or is it just attached units? Because because there's certain th things about, like, I, I don't really know the ruling exactly, because I know that a lot of attached units actually share you know there's like share seas for example can be used on attached units so if that's the case then this should work with weapons too um we think that are different attachments i don't know i'm not sure i don't really care i i, I it's a bandle city card that is built around attachments i hate attachments <laughs> not weapons but actual attached units so yeah for me i i don't i don't know if this will actually make a difference i think this is really expensive for what it's doing but i don't really care nonetheless then we have Shrieking Spinner, 4 mana 2-4, going from a 2-5 to a 2-4, that now gives Spider Allies plus to this round much better for the Spider Archetype, kind of like acting as a uh, bit of a different take on the Frenzied Skitter, right? Very dangerous now, because if all of a sudden cards like House Spider, anything that's spreading out with Elise, you're threatening so much damage if this thing gets to attack, but now it has four health, which means that it can die to something like an Arachnoid Sentry Ravenous Flock, for example. Uh, not Riptide Servant anymore. <laughs> but other shit can kill it at four, and uh, it still can technically, it, it can trade into Fearsome, so there's some issues be, uh, behind the stat line, but ultimately very, very powerful. I think this time it'll make the slot into spiders. I, I have a hard time seeing how it wouldn't really like a plus two power boost to all of your spiders on attack. Like that's kind of, that's really nuts, right? Like that is a 
ridiculous buff if you think about it. Oh, I paid one health <laughs> to give everything one more power. Like that is just bonkers, actually. So yeah, spider players, those of you who enjoy this sort of like you know very nuanced art type, uh, definitely gonna be looking into this card, and uh, you definitely gonna wonder if you want to be adding into it. Maybe I'll play a spider deck one of these days. Why not? You know, when I want to shut off my brain. Four mana Ritual of Renewal. Going from seven mana slow spell that heals seven and draws one to four mana healing four and drawing one. Very interesting. I still don't know, is this playable? I mean, it technically, it should be, right? Because you have stuff like Star Shaping. But Star Shaping is burst speed and it's giving you a finisher, right? But I feel like this card is, is it is playable. I'm not sure if it'll fit certain decks because it's still, you know, a beefy play, right? Just to heal and cycle but it's definitely interesting and it actually becomes a card to think about now because before it wasn't a card to think about like you were never going to be main decking ritual of renewal like ever right <laughs> so now there's a consideration and i think that's already a win in of itself and i don't know if like maybe they, they hinted any any cool like combo here but they didn't rippers bay this is a really interesting change now when allies attack before triggering lurk grant the top ally of your deck lurk and it becomes a lurker wait what Oh, it becomes a lurker means that it triggers lurk. Okay, okay, yeah, because I, I, <laughs> I thought it was being a little bit redundant, right? Like, granted lurk, like, gr granted dragon, and it becomes a dragon. You're like, I, I, I was a little bit confused. So, yeah, this um, this is really cool. But it's important to note that now if you hit a spell, for example, then, then Ripper's Bay won't trigger, right? But I want to try to build a lurk deck that actually doesn't have that many lurk units, you know, like that uses Ripper's Bay. Maybe is there any way to, like, fish for this? I'm not sure, but maybe, but I think there's there's tools. Maybe you like. All right, we're back. Uh, my OBS crashed. That is the first time my OBS crashes during a recording, and I I actually realized it because I was talking and I was moving my hands and I hit my hat and it like went flat. <laughs> and I'm like, oh shit! And I look at the recording and and like the image is frozen. I'm like, what? <laughs> So yeah, it it like I I was I went I was like all the way uh it happened when I was talking about the mammoth shaman here so I, we didn't lose that much footage because thankfully my recording was saved uh, somehow I don't I don't even know how that's possible but it, it it is that was like thirty minutes oh my god imagine I had to do that all over again holy shit we would have missed the react Andy to Swain as well so which we're gonna talk about uh, so yeah we mentioned uh, Ripper's Bay what well, basically what I ended saying is that I, I'm really excited to build uh, decks around Ripper's Bay it's not gonna be a meta defining change but it is going to be a fun defining change and it's yeah that's a nice one that's nah, actually terrible but yeah ultimately uh, I just am really eager to build lurk decks without just slapping a bunch of lurk cards together and calling it a deck right like really really excited for the deck building possibilities that this enables and uh, very very happy that this change happened you know not every not every balance change has to be meta defining and uh, I really really appreciate it so now we move on to Leviathan it's recording hasn't crashed great so well, what do, I, what do I say about Leviathan? I mean, the same thing with Swain. Like, Swain with Overwhelm, amazing. This is a change that's also going to make Leviathan significantly better. Even though you're sacrificing one ping and you're losing one health, the health is pretty, it's close to irrelevant, really, at that stage. But uh, the ping definitely matters because now open attacking with Swain with the Leviathan is not as backbreaking, but it still is, especially because you got that Overwhelm onto it. So. Love it. Absolutely love it. Swain is coming back with a vengeance, and I cannot wait to bring him back. I, I don't know. I, 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 I've already said it. Like, top three of my favorite champions, and fucking love it. Really, really like these changes. Magical Journey is actually a real card now. What I mean by that is before, it really, it really wasn't, you know, because it says you plant a portal randomly in the top four cards of your deck, and then you plant three chimes on random cards in your deck. Like, you're not going to play this card in a chime deck, first of all, the vast majority of the time. And second of all, like, randomly, like, now it, it's actually a real card that, you know, the second effect is worth reading as you're planting a chime on the top card of your deck. This is what the card should have been from the beginning. So, hey, better late than never, right? Realms Caretaker, a little bit thicker. Still uh, not going to see much play, I think, but maybe I'm wrong. Then we got Grumpy Rock Bear. Really like this change. Like I said in the last footage, big fan of changes that will uh, affect other cards indirectly, right? 
So this is an indirect buff to three cards that I know of. The uh, the two mana landmark that spawns the rock, the rock bear, the four mana landmark that spawns the gro be rock bear, but buffs it as well. And uh, of course, the desert naturalist, arguably, or not arguably really a fact, the most impactful one. But I like it that changing a token like this will buff several cards and will overall enhance the landmark archetype within Shirima, and I think that's just a very, very good call that nobody really was asking for, but that we should, most of us should be happy to see, at least. Not including, like, landmark haters, if they, they exist. Fun Smith going from a 1-3 to a 2-3, very fun change. <laughs> Garbage. So Fun Smith is, uh, you know, not a card that you want to be using much to trade into stuff, but being able to represent more damage upon attack with her, and also being able to use her body in a pinch and actually trade into stuff if you need to is very neat. So it's a buff that's not going to make her top tier by any means, but it's definitely going to make her a little bit better. And I am all for that because I really am a big fan of this unit. And now we're going to reach where we left it with the Mammoth Shaman uh, going from a 4 4 to a 5 5 uh, with Overwhelm with a round and, uh, and turning into the Mammoth Rager. So, uh, some significant stat boosts that hopefully make the card uh, playable. Really, really cool card. The art I like a lot. And I'm going to try to see if I can come up with something cool around it. It's, it is a, a nice win condition that you can definitely work towards, but it is outshined by other stuff in the plunder decks that you want to be running this, even though now that Riptide Sermon took the hit, who knows? And then we got, last but not least, the Wind Singer. Ionia, six mana, three, three, now gets Elusive. Gets the Elusive treatment, so it can hopefully become somewhat relevant. I think it's a pretty relevant buff, actually, because now you play this, it can be used as a nice tempo play that also allows you to push for damage, and it can also be a very nice card to add on to a hand buff deck right a deck that in which you're buffing your hand you can play the five uh, mana um, the five mana four four i forgot its name but the the grand an ally in hand plus three plus three and you can play this you got a six mana elusive and you can bounce something as well so that's interesting you know it's aeonia you know like not the most interesting region right now because it is uh it's arguably the strongest, right? And uh, we're always trying to be edgy and then playing the, the less represented or the lesser represented. My English is, like I said, awful today. But ultimately, I think it's a neat change and it can open up for some, some flexibility within deck building in the pink region. And that, those are the changes right there. Overall, I think this patch is one hell of a hit. It's either a hit or a miss, and this is definitely a hit. A big fan of the vast majority of changes. Super eager to try out the new face of Daybreak. Even even that try out put in a video a thing ago. And uh, really, really excited to mess around with the others uh, as well. More deck building opportunities. More flexibility within cards, which is something that I'm always happy to see. It's a much needed nerfs. Not all the nerfs were needed, but most of them. Uh, are here you know uh, ionia is still gonna be quite prevalent but everything else has been toned down and i i just i'm i'm gonna have wet dreams about this for a while just, just gotta be honest all right so let's uh let's go over real quick like some of the um the other stuff that i don't have to go over the patch you know like we got the uh the champion skins with uh, Corrupted Zoe. We saw the card back for Corrupted Zoe, and now we actually get Corrupted Zoe, so I'm gonna have to build a Corrupted Zoe deck because this is absolutely sick, and uh, I have to do it for the views. Then we got, um, what is this? Oh, Garen! Garen finally makes it into the D&D uh, skin set, which is really neat, and, oh, no new deer. Oh, new deer. <laughs> uh, 12 all right that's it overall fantastic patch what do you guys think let me know in the comment section down below hopefully you enjoyed this video and uh, i'm just really grateful that i didn't lose 30 minutes of recording over the first time obs crashes ever now i have to say now not only do i have to check to make sure i'm recording i have to make sure that i'm not crashing so expect more you know right way looks for me in the upcoming videos and yeah love you have a soul day thank you guys for watching stay tuned for daily legend of Frontier content let me know which new buffed card or archetype you want me to showcase first i'll see you guys tomorrow